if you didn't receive some hard copies of these notes, I'm sure there's some. Uh, we, we haven't done this type of notes for a long time, but uh, some people ask for, so we go back to the good old hard notes. Uh, I send out those notes uh, online in all our different outlet media, so uh, it's good for you to follow and uh, as we talk about today. So welcome everyone. <clears throat> the topic we're going to uh, launch or talk about this month and uh, this time is the area of family entitled Winning Families. However, when you hear the word however or but, you know that something's changed. In the last couple of weeks, uh, it's, it's a hot topic on uh, giving, tithes, offering, curses, the law, and things like that. So do we request if I can uh, <clears throat> uh, talk a little bit more about this. That would include other uh, areas of the family. So I decided to uh, add that to our day and discuss the, the whole area based on three words, covenant, curses, and the law. Amen. <clears throat> so the, uh, the topic of the law, the law of Moses, uh, if you really understand this topic and the, the Old Testament, it will give you such a powerful foundation of your understanding of the rest of the Bible. Amen. Come on, say amen. Amen. Langi was a good teacher. Langi is a teacher. You know, when teacher comes up, the, the students, like, they don't want to say much in case they get the punishment. So the teacher is over there and the apostle is up here. So we're going to talk. Uh, apostle is a father. So kids, anyway, they are not kids. Welcome as I talk about this topic. The three main areas you see up here, the, the main one is the law. That's what we call the law. And uh, it's a very tough, uh, it's, a, it's a deep topic. It's not easy, but I promise I'll make it very easy for us, for you. So today, uh, take it, everything you can take it in and, and listen as I take you through this journey. The last couple of months, I was basically taking you through the journey of the Bible. If you do a Bible college course, you will go through topics like uh, Bible survey. Bible survey, you survey the Bible right through the Old Testament and the New Testament. When you build a house, there are people that come and survey the land. Make sure it's okay to build a house and a building on the land. So that's what we are doing to dig out some things. The greatest teacher of the Word of God is not me. It's the Holy Spirit. Amen? But we do have experts called theologians and scholars and people that study the Word of God, just like in any other different areas, that they study different things. When it comes to the Bible, the Word of God, Men like those uh, who scholars and uh, academics who studied the Bible all have some idea of what the Bible says. And those study passed down to the average people and us that we try to understand. And one thing for sure is that not everybody has got the whole truth. Amen. And that's why it's important for you to check it yourself as well. When we talk about the topic of like finance and giving, it's always good to understand these things. However, a lot of these things, when it comes to this area, not just the topic of money, tithe, and giving, but things like the Sabbath. Are we supposed to keep the old Sabbath or things like that today, there's a lot of those questions. A good, solid understanding of this thing about the law 
it's, it's, it's a very good start for us. And then, uh, from these different uh, interpretations, we can learn different things. For me, I do a lot of studies and things like that. And I, the most thing that excited me is what the Holy Spirit tells me. Amen? Everything the Holy Spirit tells you, the next thing you need to do is to check and see if it's in line with the Word of God. Amen. So last, uh, I think last week, Holy Spirit showed me some really good things that I would like. Those are part of what, so I study what other people say. I study what I think of what other people say and what the Bible says. And then the third level, I go and talk with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, can you teach me some more? So that's where we are. And that's what we always do every Sunday for whoever comes up here, they do those studies. But this, uh, the three topics are, are very important topics. The, the law of Moses, there are three things I want to talk about. The law, the covenants, and the curses. Uh, I'd like to read a few verses before we get into that. But it's also connected to the family. Marriage is a covenant. Uh, if you can put up this verse, or let me read it to you from the book of... The, the book of Malachi, that is the last book of the Old Testament. Let me go back. There are two parts of the Bible, the Old and the New. We all know that. The Old Testament starts from Genesis up to Malachi. In the book of Genesis, the first five books is called the Pentateuch, which are the five books of Moses. Moses wrote those books. Some people debate and they think, oh, Moses didn't write the Genesis and that. Oh, well, no one was able to write and witness those days. But Moses, Moses appeared in the Bible about two and a half thousand, actually 2,442 when Moses came on the scene. Thousands of years, but it's through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit Revealing thing, Moses was able to record things like that. And now we get to Moses here. And fast forward to the end of the Old Testament. In the book of Malachi, you'll find these three things. Malachi, God was not very happy with his people. And he said that, first thing he said, you broke my covenant. And you find that the first, it's like God was complaining. In Malachi chapter 1, it's not up there, it's part of the introduction. In Malachi chapter 1, he said, you broke my covenant because you gave me blemish sacrifice. You got your animals, your sick animals, you brought them to me, and that's not what I want. I want you to, that's why part of the tithes and off, offering purpose is that we learn to fear God and give and honor God through our wealth. Through worship, we learn that it's nothing to do with what, what the debates are about these days. So we said that the second thing God complained about is the marriage covenant. You find that in chapter 2, verse uh, 14. This is what it says there. You have been unfaithful to her, talking about the husband and the wife. Through she is your partner the wife of your marriage covenant. There you see the covenant. The end of the law, God talks about covenant, and he's now talking here, not, not that one, but he's talking about the marriage covenant. We are talking about marriage covenant. The marriage covenant starts right from Genesis 1. Right from the beginning, God said, for this reason... A husband will leave his family and be united with his wife, and the two shall become one. That is the beginning of the marriage covenant. Right up to the end of the New Old Testament, God said, you being unfaithful to the wife of that marriage covenant. Okay? Let's stop there. and Let's uh, go on to chapter 3, where we've heard about this. God said, 
give me the tithes and offering, and you are under a curse. You know that verse? You always hear at church? You are under a curse. Now I'll expand on that word. So we'll find here that God is talking about these three things. The law, the covenant, and the curses. A quick one for marriage, anybody, that when you come together in marriage, you are entering a covenant. A covenant is an agreement, is a binding agreement between more than one parties. In the Bible, it's always an agreement between God and people. So in marriage, it's an agreement between you, the husband and wife, and God. It is a binding forever agreement. But of course, we know there's divorce and separation. Every covenant, there has to be something to confirm the covenant. When it comes to marriage and other covenants, death is always involved. In a marriage covenant, you must die to your individualistic, to your individual personality and everything, but come together to make the covenant work. Amen? So why some people don't want to get married. They don't want the commitment of the covenant. But you know, God can help you with those things. That's why there are premarital counseling and talk before you really share your covenant on the day of the wedding. If you are to look for a secret of successful marriage, it is happened when you die to your personal self and be united as one unit before God. That is it. Now let's move on to this topic here. I've got some notes here for you. You can follow. Who doesn't have any notes? If you want to follow, if you, if, if you don't have any notes, if you don't want it, just, just watch us up here. Now let's go straight to this topic here. Uh, <clears throat> these are the covenants. I, I put there, there's a lot of covenants, but the key ones is between God and Adam, between God and Noah, God and Abraham, God and Moses, and uh, David. God and David. And, the, and Jesus' covenant. Jesus, when he came, he said, this is my new covenant. And let's go through these uh, scriptures here. You look it up here. The first one of this agreement is Adam and God. This covenant is known or called the Edenic Eden from the Garden of Eden comes this one. It's between God and Adam. If you look at the part of those notes there, from Adam to Abraham, it's about 2,000 years. You hear that? If you look at the story of Abraham, it comes from Genesis 12. That means a gap between Genesis 1 and 12 is about 2,000 years. Roughly about that. That's a lot of years. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the earth. Basically that. Between verse 1 and verse 2, there is a possibility of million years between that gap. If you look at creation, two words are used there. In verse 1 and 2, it talks about creation. From verse 3 onwards, it doesn't use the word creation. It used the word made. And God made and God created. We'll, we'll, we'll look at those things later. But let's get to this covenant. Abraham and God, you see the scriptures there. You find it in Genesis 1 and 2. And the rest of the, we don't, we're not going to read all those. But if you want to know more, you can study that. And the parties involved is God, Adam, and Eve. The place of this covenant is Eden, right? The Garden of Eden. The reason for the covenant is that um, Adam 
is taken there, the purpose in those two words, they are there to rule and reign over all the creation of God, what God created and made. The sign of that governance, um, yeah, you can go up and down. The, the, if you see up there, it goes this way. Sorry, it should have gone this way. But um, the sign of that covenant is a tree of life. Every covenant, there has to be a sign, a symbol. And the conditions and the result, the result of that covenant was curse. Yeah, is it up there? Yeah, curse. The result of that is curse. Curse came and, and what happened there? In Genesis chapter 2, God said, hey, our agreement, you're going to rule over everything. But there is this tree that you are not supposed to touch. In chapter 3 of this covenant, Adam failed and he sinned. Now, let's look at, the, look at these verses in, in, in chapter 3. When Adam sinned, this is what God said. Adam, you sinned. I'm going to curse you. If you read those verses, listen to this. God said first to the snake. See the snake? That thing that goes like this. God said, snake, from now onwards. Do you know snakes used to have legs? Used to have four legs. But from that day, God said, I'm going to remove your legs. But from today, you're going to crawl around on your stomach. To this day, you still see snakes crawl around. He said to punish you. And then to Eve, God said to Eve, the mother of all women, Eve, from today, you got two punishments. You're going to give birth with pain. When you go to labor, it's going to be labor pain. Any woman that gave birth to kids know it's painful. I don't know how the feeling is, but I've heard it's very painful. Is that true? Anyway, I'm sure it's true because I was standing there one of those moments and watch Helen. She wasn't doing Facebook or smiling at that moment. So it's painful. It's part of the situation. And the next thing that God said, Eve, because you... Listen to that, snake. Your heart will always go after your husband. You'll be, it's basically you'll be under the control of your husband forever. And then, this is the funny part, the interesting part. He said to the snake, I punish you here. And he said to Eve, I'm going to punish you. But when he came to Adam, he said, Adam... There's a curse coming. The curse is here. And God said, the ground is cursed because of you. Now watch this part here. God never said, I will curse you. God didn't say, Adam, you are cursed. He said, Adam, I'm going to curse the ground because of you. <laughs> are you following that part? Then from there, God said, I, used, I created a garden, it says there, for you to enjoy. You don't need to work anything. You just say to the, the chicken, chicken, come here. Uh, animals, you, you rule and, and you do whatever you want. You name them and you eat it, whatever you want. But from this day, you're going to wait with sweat to till the ground to provide for your food. And that is because the crown is cursed. You are not cursed, but the crown is cursed. And then the second part of the curse, he said, I created you to live forever, but today you're going to die. And God said, because I created you out of that dirt, your body is dead, going to go back to dead. That's why when people said, you hear a preacher said, now, oh brother, dead, dust, going back to dust. Dead, 
back to dead. It's part of the curse. Amen? Now let's move on to Noah. The story of Noah, you see up the notes, you get that. Let me explain it. After Adam now went out, you know Adam's kids, the first two, they were naughty in the topic of offering. It's basically a combination of the concept of tithe in there because a portion came out. The second part I mentioned before is that the offering has to come from a blood because God's sacrifice and covenant has to be confirmed through a blood. Anyway, let's move on from there to Noah. And, and it says there that uh, Cain, you know, Cain killed Abel. And then Cain started to go out. He was so mad. He was so angry. And started producing children. That's a, that's a, 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 oh, that's a question. Where did Cain got his wife from? Because it doesn't say there. However, at the same time, his dad, Adam and Eve, got other children. They started to multiply. So it's a possibility that Cain married one of his sisters somewhere. Is there in the Bible? No, that marriage is not there. But because of the logic of the situation. So when from there, what happened there? That angel, uh, actually, people started to behave with wickedness. And now we got on to chapter 4, chapter 5, and chapter 6 of Genesis. And God looked down, and this is what happened. God saw that the fallen angels is now come and married the daughters of men. And that's where we got giants. It's not very about giants. It came from that. So God was not very excited. In the spiritual world, I shared this yesterday at uh, some retreat. There are three main realms of the spirit. First one is God's realm, where God lives. That is an eternal realm. The second one is angels' realm, where angels live. The third one is man, where we live on earth. In this realm, only humans were given the right to rule. Not demons, not angels, only us given the right to, to rule here. In the middle of the angels and the realm is called the heavenly places. That is where spiritual warfare happens. Every time you read the word heavenly realms, it's happened there. So the new, uh, the, when Satan fell from heaven, he came with these angels. They are now called demons. That's where they live. But what happened? Those demons came and start looking for girlfriends and boyfriends on the children of men. Did you know that still happened today? Hello? It still happened today. There are demonic spirits that are living with humans. Anyway, there's another topic. Let's come down to the topic of covenant. So in this place, God was not happy and he said, I'm going to destroy everything. Kill everything. You know the story of Moses. That's what happened. Uh, sorry, the story of the flood. In there, we see the next covenant up there and in your notes. Let, let, let me continue the story. <coughs> God said, I'm going to bring the flood. Noah, come, bring your family, build the boat. And on the day of the flood, God said, get inside the boat. You and your family, uh, what, what? there are three groups that went there. It's human that went inside through one family. The second group are the animals. The animals went inside, and the third group were the birds. You never read anywhere there where God says, take the trees inside the tree, inside the boat. It didn't. All life, living creatures, were taken inside the boat, Human, animals, and birds. And then the flood came, destroyed everything, 
birds, animals, and human did. And when the flood is finished, Noah offered a sacrifice to God. And it came to God's nostril, and he was very excited about it. He said, Noah, I'm going to have a covenant with you. This is the covenant, the second part. It's the Noahic Noah covenant. And he said, Noah, I'm not going to curse the earth anymore. I actually, the life. From this day, no more death of all life on earth. But you know, the trees were still alive. How do you know that? After the flood, Noah said the bird, a dove, and the dove came back with an olive leaf. You know that story? Yeah. So it came back. And Noah said, no more of that curse. Covenant, curse, I'll come to the law. After that, after Noah, we get to Abraham. Abraham was called by God. He was not a Jew. He was an Iraqi. And God said, get out of that. Come to your place. Now we are in chapter 12. And I'm going to have another covenant with you. God said to Abraham, now we are on a third one. Abraham, I'm going to bless you forever. Your covenant, this covenant is right up to you and me today. It's called the Abrahamic covenant. Jesus came out of that line. In fact, it's all come through this. I won't talk a lot about that, but that's a covenant of Abraham. That covenant didn't have a curse. Then David's covenant didn't have a curse. But let's get to Noah. This is where the law comes in. When the time of Noah came on the scene, God made a covenant with Noah and the people and his people, the Israelites. Now, this is a part that we must understand. The law of Moses. Oh, thank you, Lion. This covenant was given with all those scriptures. It's between God and the nation of Israel. It's for the Jews only. Listen to this. This is where the law comes in. When people complain or actually debate, you know, some people said, oh, we don't want the Old Testament. Uh, we, we are not living under the law. They think the Old Testament is the law. Hello? The Old Testament is not the law. The law is only from Moses to Malachi. You see that? Oh, I don't keep tithe. I don't do that because we are under the New Testament. All that stuff is under the law. Hello? 3,000 years. The law is only 1,000 years. From Moses to Malachi. The rest is all other things. Now let's go on to this covenant. God said, I'm going to give you that covenant now starts in Exodus. Start on the Ten Commandments. It's given in the whole lot. This goes right up to uh, Malachi, and that's the end of the law. Between the end of the Old Testament and the New Testament is 400 years that God didn't say anything. He was silent on there. But there... To quickly uh, fast forward with this one. This covenant of the law was full of punishment and curses. A lot of curses here. If you don't, we're going to curse here. And then after the law came Jesus Christ. When Jesus came, now we are in the New Testament. Jesus came and on the night before he was crucified on a cross. There was something called the last dinner. The last supper. You know what happened during that supper? Jesus said, this is my body. And this is a piece of bread for you. This is a new covenant between me and you. 
Now we enter a third, uh, the covenant of Jesus Christ. In the covenant of Adam, the symbol was the tree of life. In the covenant of Noah, the symbol was the rainbow. God said, every time you see the rainbow, no more flood, no more worldwide flood. In the covenant with Noah, with Moses, what was the symbol? Many symbols, but the blood of the bull. Animals, that blood. In the New Testament, what was the symbol of that covenant that we still do today? Baptism and communion. Every time you do baptism and communion, it reminded you of what I've done on this new covenant. Are we following all right? Now let's move on to curses that will take us to all the debates and the questions and the confusions and the misquotation and arguments and divisions about the law. Now let's move on to the curses. Curses, when it comes to, I'll, I'll, I'll bring the Malachi 3, verse 10 to 12, to put as an example. In Malachi, it says, God said, you rob me with what? Where are the m &Ms? <laughs> You rob me with tithes and offering. And he said in verse 10, bring me the tithe because when you rob me, you are under a curse. Did you know that? Did you read that? You are under a curse because you are withholding the tithe that belongs to me. After saying that in verse 10, he said, now bring me the tithe. He didn't say bring me the tithes and the offering. Or else you under the curse. You notice how God didn't say to Adam, I'm going to curse you. Remember that? When it comes to there, God never said, if you don't tithe, you are under a curse. That? Some people think tithing is not for today because we are not under the law and we are not under a curse. The curse of Noah was finished. When was that finished? Anybody smart and think about what I just said about 30, 20 minutes ago? Noah's curse was finished on the day when God said, I'm not going to wipe out life anymore. The covenant finished that. Are you people following? I'm sure you are. I spoke about covenant. I spoke about the law in a very brief way. But now we're coming to curses. And God said, Noah, I'm not going to curse it anymore. No more loss of life. That's why today you don't see any more worldwide flood. There are floods, but no more wiping off of human and animals and birds. The poor dove, he was frying and frying, frying. Yeah, maybe frying. Someone was frying the bird. And he couldn't. So God said, no more of that. Are you following this? The curse of Noah ended in Genesis 8. And he said straight after that, from today, I'm going to start everything with a principle called seed, time, and harvest. The only reason why we are here because a seed from your dad was planted in your mom and out you came. Unfortunately, it's a painful process. Now, the curse of the law, the curse of Moses. It's not Moses, but the curse of Moses' covenant. 
When was that finished? Anyone smart? I know you're all smart. The curse of the lower was finished on the cross. Galatians chapter 3, it says it was nailed on the cross. Hear that? Noah's curse was finished in chapter 8. The curse of this law that people talk about finished on the cross. We, we all right on that? Now, what about the curse of Adam? When is the curse of Adam finished? This is the part I ask the Holy Spirit. Anybody? When? The curse of Adam is still there. It's not finished. And the Holy Spirit said to me, that curse will finish when the new heaven and the new earth started. You miss an amen on that one. That curse is still here today. So, friends, the curse of the law that a lot of people don't understand is long gone. The curse of Adam is still here. How do you know? <laughs> How do you know? The cross and the resurrection did not remove the painful labor of a mother. Amen? The cross and the resurrection did not stop your, your body from getting old. Let me just talk about it. The cross and the resurrection does not stop you from dying. Where did that case come from? Right from the beginning. It fixed in the be started in Genesis and it's going to end in Revelation. Revelation chapter 21 and chapter 22 says this. 22 verse 3. It says, God said, I will bring, actually, let me explain. 21 and 22, God said, I will bring a new heaven and a new earth. And in 22 verse 3, God said, there will be no more curse. You following that? Why say no more curse when he already nailed it on the cross? He was talking about Adam's day curse. There are all the scriptures there for you. Now let me go back, take you back to Malachi. When God said, you robbed me, he said, you are under a curse. Do you know what, what curse he was talking about? Do you work that out? It's not the curse of the law. It's not the curse of Noah. It's the curse of Adam he was talking about. You are under a curse. God never said, I'm going to curse you or it's a new curse. The earth is already cursed. That is why I said in the last couple of weeks, when you build a new house, it's already in you. It's a conscience. The curse in Malachi church. If ever you read people complain about the curse in the law, now you know. It has nothing to do with the law. The curse of the law stops on the cross. Yes. However, you're going to discover too that the law is very interesting. All scriptures are given for our good. I got in the notes here, you'd be so surprised to find that it says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, it's in these notes, Paul himself who complained about the law to the Galatians, he said, for the law is good if you use it lawfully. 
In Romans 3, 31, if you read this book of Romans, there's a lot of things Paul go on and on about the law. Then this is what he says twice. Verse 31, Romans 3, we cannot overthrow the law because of this faith. We uphold the law. He was talking about we are saved by grace and faith and we're not. And then the next minute he said, does that mean we're going to throw the law? No way. We uphold the law. Uh, we don't have time, but there's a beautiful explanation of all these small scriptures. And then in chapter 7 of Romans, verse 12, it says, The law is holy, the law is righteous, and the law is good. Amen. Three parts of the law. Civil ceremonial, and moral. Amen? I mentioned that. Let me add that to you. Civil laws are laws that govern the people. And in the case of the law of Moses, it's only for the Jews. These civil laws, then the second part, ceremonial laws, are the laws about their feast, their celebration, how they live, their family, how to all that. But the third level is moral law. What are moral laws? That's the first law that God gave in Exodus. Moral laws are laws that are based on God's will and God's character. It's from the character of God. And this character are binding in the heart of every person. When Paul in the New Testament said, I no longer, God no longer writes the law on a tablet, but He's now writing in your hearts the laws of God. In that whole list of the Ten Commandments, the same law there is the same law we use in the New Testament, except Sabbath. And there's a reason for that. Because Jesus said, I did, that's why Jesus said, I did not come to abolish. A Polish man doesn't use anymore. He never said that. I came to fulfill. And when he said, this is the cup of a new covenant. And Paul said, we're now under a better covenant. If you have two cars, one car is still running, and now you bought a new car. Does that mean your old car is bad? <laughs> you can give it for me. It's still running. It's still good. But you now got a better car. And God made Jesus Christ made it better. Well done. We're almost there. He made it better. We explained that. He said, in the old days, you heard that when one punched you here, you punch back. Today, when he punched you here, turn here. When he wants your jacket, give him another jacket. When he wants to go one mile, one mile in bay, go two miles. Go the extra mile and the whole lot of things. Then he move on to moral laws. Today, if people say, listen to this, that we don't use the Old Testament law, that is very stupid. In the Old Testament law, it says, thou shalt not murder. Does that mean it's okay to murder now because it's removed? Pastor Lima will take you to jail. He's a policeman. Does that mean we now go and have whatever wife we want? Do adultery? Thou shalt not in the Old Testament. Actually, that's the beginning. That's a moral law we still do now. See how this, how brain of people think that we don't live in the Old Testament, we don't live in the law of Kalo. It's just that you don't understand. Moral laws are still all applied. The first four of the Ten Commandments is between you and God. The last six is between you and another person. And guess where tithing comes in? It comes in a moral law. You have a moral responsibility to worship God. You have a moral responsibility to give to God's work. You have a moral responsibility to have the fear of God. Now, in the New Testament, things change. Jesus changed a lot of things. Now, 
when it comes to giving, tithes and offering, Jesus said we don't do the things today like we used to. The biggest problem, using the, word, the tithe as an example, that people complain about, if, if you read all the complaints, first major one is that we're no longer under the law and now you're here. It has nothing to do with Moses' law. It's to do with the curse on the crown that God spoke about in Genesis, actually in Malachi. Another thing, you will never have any instruction, because some people, they say, oh, no, 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 because people are, and they go back. The question is, whoever is doing that today? Whoever is telling people that if you don't print your tithe, you are, under, you are cursed. God will curse you. If I go to a church where the pastor will get up and say, you, God's going to curse you, man, I'll run to a, another church. You hear that? It doesn't work like that today. Today is the heart. It's a matter of your heart. That's why I like the tithe. Because it's a perfect system to guide us on our giving. And then comes these last two things about the tithes and offering. In, in the New Testament, Paul taught tithes and offering in two books. Tithe is a portion. He shared that in the first Corinthians. Some of you who follow this, I don't need to repeat everything what Jesus said, so you all that. The second part is the sowing of seed. Now let me say this about sowing. You know, sowing a seed, that's the offering part. Whether you a Christian or a non-Christian, whether you love God or don't like God, whether you're an atheist or whatever, whoever you are, when you sow something, you still get a harvest. Yeah? You still get a harvest. It doesn't matter whether you believe God, believe tithes and offering. When you sow a seed, because it's a principle. Ask Bill Gates. <laughs> he resigned from doing computer to work on how to give away his money. When you sow a seed, you still get a harvest, no matter what. It's a universal principle. However, not everybody that sows seed are blessed by God. It's blessed or it's you, you get results because it's God's principle. However, we discover that there will be giving that God accepts and giving that does not accept by God. Many people think they give great money and great things for God and even to the church. They think that's their way to heaven. No, no, no. It doesn't work like that. You think, oh, God's going to be so happy with me. God has blessed me with my giving. Turn up on the door. And God said, no, no, that, that, that's that side for you. You did not receive. You think I bless you with your giving? It blesses people on earth. It even blesses pastor. But in front of me, it's not. Heaps of scriptures on that. When it comes to the tithe, this is the last illustration. Say you are... Say there are five people here sitting on the tithe and the, each one have a box. Every time you give, God say, you know, the, the earth that's cursed. My principle, when you give your tithe, I will remove that curse on the earth. Only on your block. Say if there's five people giving their tithe. God said, I cancel Noah's curse. I cancel Moses' curse. But the earth that I curse, it's still there. It's just part of the principle of things. My way of fixing that is this thing called tithe. When you tithe, say three people, five people, three give tithe and two does not give the tithe. You are still sitting not on the case of the law, but the land is cursed. And God said, I will remove it supernaturally. Now there's another stage called the offering. The offering 
is X to the tithe. And God said, that offering is a free will offering. When you keep whatever you want to keep. However, God put a formula there. He said, if you give a small offering, you get a small harvest. If you give a big offering, you give us a big oven. Big oven, or maybe a big oven. Now, this is the funny part. There are some people, they deliberately don't want to give anything to God. They just refuse. They're stingy or whatever. Does that mean God doesn't love you? No, God loves you. And some people think, oh, yep. Other people are giving the offering. I'll just go with my $5. Many statistics, even in our own church. If we look at the tithe part, you see this is the number of people that are giving tithe. Then you look at the offering, it's only this part. If you calculate that, <laughs> I'm also good in maths. Based on the people that just give, it sort of work out the people who don't give tithe, they only give about $5. Do you get that? Does that mean to make you guilty? No. Because what I'm showing you, this is the reality of things. Now let me end with this. In the New Testament, I share our testimony that we never give based on the 10%. We give based on our hearts. That's why we give our tithe. I love the word tithe. It's good to use. That's why we use it. It's a beautiful guideline for our giving. But if you think that you have to follow the 10%, that's not, that's not right. That's the Old Testament stuff. Even though it's, no, that makes you, let's make it legalistic. Some people, as I mentioned, they calculate exactly $25.40. Throw away the calculator. If you give more, God is blessed with you. Even, I believe, even if you give less than the, 10%, God still loves you. It's your heart. And it's only between you and God. Today, I spoke about covenant. You get it? It's an agreement between God and man. I mentioned the law. The law finished a long time ago. We don't follow. Jesus make it better. And the last one I mentioned, curses. When you hear people complain about curses, it's nothing to do with the curses of the law. Amen? Are you getting that today? Give a hand for Jesus. And then some people, some people came to me and said, should I tithe on the cross or the net? You know what? That's almost like it's a good question. But it doesn't work like that today. If your heart is joyful, type on your cross, God loves you. If you type on your net, God loves you. My way of typing, I don't type on the net. I don't type on the cross. I type on the joyful heart, which is well over the cross and the net. That's in New Testament giving. Hallelujah. Amen. You happy? If you're happy and you know it, Clap your hands. It's 11 o'clock. I hope this topic of the law, the curses, the covenant is very clear for you. In the notes I sent to you, it says here, every part of the law, all, every part of the Bible, all the New Testament, we will always learn good lessons from. Don't throw it away. Jesus said, until the end of time, none of the letters of the old and the new will ever go away. He made it better. That is why you confuse some. That's what the people confuse about this. Because every time you see verses of the law, it talks about multiple laws and multiple application. That's why you said, Oh, I thought we don't long do the law, but it's appear here in Romans or it depends on which law you're talking about. Let's all stand.
turn to the person next to you and, and, and say, did you get that? If, you, if, the person, if your neighbors didn't get it, just give them a, uh, just say, well, what? Did you open your ears? Open the eyes of my Lord.